China is something that in the West, even until as recently as the 1300s, was more of a mystery to us. Until a Venetian by the name of Marco Polo decided he wanted to take an extended holiday and go and tour off round Asia. And with the publication of his travels, Europe got its first detailed description of Asia and the Far East. But with that being said, let's see if we can piece together the mysteries of China from the very beginning. For today, we start with the birth of civilization in what would one day become China. Today, we begin with the Xia Dynasty of China. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, my fellow historians around the world, and welcome back to our series on a history of humanity as part of the Grand Portfolio. Continuing with our theme of the first civilizations, we're going today even further east than India. And don't worry all of you Akkadian Empire and Mesopotamia enthusiasts, we will be returning to that area of the world in due course. But today, we're going to start looking at China. So far we know a little bit about Chinese culture, what with my earlier videos on both New Year and Chinese New Year, go ahead and check those out if you haven't already. We know, of course, how the Chinese Zodiac came to be, why Chinese New Year is celebrated on a different day every year, and of course, the traditions surrounding that time of the year for China. For now, however, we return to the historical side of things. So let me take you back to roughly around the year 2100 BC, for this is where the story of China's first dynasty the Xia dynasty truly begins. Now, it is a little bit tricky, the Xia dynasty, because myth and actual written history for ancient China, at least, tends to get a bit mixed up. Alas, perhaps the only thing we have written down about the Xia dynasty comes from the bamboo annals which unfortunately dips a little bit into the more legendary, mythical and spectacular side of things. Makes for great media, makes for great video games, makes for great films, but not so much for studying history. God damn it. Can you please just keep the propaganda and myths separate from the written history for five seconds? Thank you. God. The other record of ancient Chinese history we have also is known as the records of the Grand Historian, or as it's known in Mandarin, Shu Ti. But if we're basing what we know of the Xia Dynasty of China on credible documents here, we can't even use Shu Ti, because it was in fact written in 94 BC by the Han Dynasty official Sima Qian. But I suppose in order to do some learning today, we sort of have to throw credibility to the wind a bit. And that's something I don't like to do very often, so I am breaking my own rules a bit here, but... Let's see how we go, and see how far we get, and see how much we learn. This is going to be a tricky one, but just bear with me. Hopefully we will learn something today, and clicking on this video was not a giant waste of your time. <laughs> okay, let's not be pessimistic here. So, to begin with, the Xia Dynasty was established roughly around the year 2070 BC. So, we're talking over 4,000 years ago. This again is roughly the same time that the Akkadian Empire came into existence and that the peoples of the Indus River Valley civilization had their civilization and influence in full swing. Like with the Akkadian Empire, however, in order to learn as much as possible about the Xia Dynasty of China, we need to go back to slightly before it was founded. So our story begins, according to what we have, with the Yellow Emperor, or as he is known, Huang Ti or Huang Di. This emperor emerged among his local tribes to rule the Shandong region between 2697 and 2597 BC. So roughly a century by this account. Huang Di 
the Yellow Emperor is said to be one of the three sovereigns of ancient China, mythical demigod god kings who ruled over regions of China. Huang Di, for instance, is accredited with the first production of silk, the institution of law and customs, the development of early medicine and agriculture to his local populace. But even with this story, we have to take it with a pinch of salt, because as I just said, one of the three sovereigns and were said to be basically like gods among men. So there we go again with myth crossing into history. Well, I try and we do what we can, so let's continue. Huang Di is said to be succeeded by his grandson, Zhuang Zhu, who according to legend is said to be one of the five emperors, the five founding fathers of the Xia dynasty of China. Huang Di, however, if you're interested, is said to be buried in the mausoleum in the Huangling County of Shanxi province in China. But you're probably going to ask me, oh, but if he's a god, how come he's dead and in a mausoleum? Please. Go and research it yourself, my head is hurting enough already from researching all this. Well, before my painkillers wear off, I suppose I should go into more detail on how the Xia dynasty itself was founded. According to legend, the five emperors were said to have founded the Xia dynasty of China after, after defeating their rivals under the leadership of Yao. Yao was another of the five emperors. And after leading his contemporaries to victory over their rivals, Yao was appointed to be the first emperor of the Xia dynasty. However, a common theme in history is that when a throne passes from one monarch or one emperor to another, they tend to inherit a whole bounty of problems that the previous monarch was unable to deal with before they passed the throne to their successor. With Yao, however, he rather took leadership within GR, but even for him, when he took the throne, he was faced with problems almost from the start. You see, the Yellow River in China is known for having violent floods, which back in ancient times were a big, big problem, especially for societies and civilizations that relied heavily on agriculture, as they did after the Neolithic Revolution. These floods, however, with the Yellow River in particular, were said to be so great, so violent, and so costly in terms of agriculture, crops, and even lives lost, which led to the river being given the eventual nickname, China's Sorrow. With lives and crops being swept away by China's Sorrow, Yao was pressed to tame the river before it could do any more damage. He appointed an, a man named Gun to help stop the flooding and control the Yellow River. Gun tried to control the river by building dikes and dams to stop the severity of the flooding and contain the river. However, after nine years of trying, nine years of dams and dikes collapsing, Gun had failed to stop the floods of the Yellow River. By this time, however, Yao had passed the throne of Xia to Shun, the last of the five emperors. And Shun, displeased with Gun's attempt at trying to stop the flooding of the Yellow River, dismissed him. What happened to Gun after that is unknown. Some accounts say he took his own life in shame. Others state how the emperor Shun imprisoned him for life. Others still, however, claim that Gun spent the rest of his life in self-exile in the mountains, but his fate is yet unknown. With the issue of these catastrophic floods still looming large over Xia, Shun appointed Gun's son Yu to complete the work. Yu, however, unlike his father, was clever, humble and resourceful. Instead of attempting to work against the forces of nature, he instead used their destructive power and used the power and momentum of the river in order to control the floods. 
Instead of constructing dikes and dams to forcefully stop the water and stop nature's true path, he instead ordered local tribes to dig canals to the sea to take the river's excess flow. It is said that during the 13 years it took to complete the task, you never stopped to rest or return to his home. Whether this is true or immoral, because this is all supposedly mythical, we can't be sure. As for the river, however, Yu's strategy to dig canals to the sea to take the Yellow River's excess flow away from the lands paid off, and so for stopping the floods and saving Xia, Emperor Shun made Yu a general for his, e for his efforts, who then went on to defeat the problematic tribe known as the San Miao, and Emperor Shun as the ultimate recognition of Yu for his efforts in not only stopping the flooding of the Yellow River, but also for de defeating the San Miao, named him as the heir to the throne of Xia. For Shun was the last of the five emperors, and from what we know, had no biological heirs to his throne. Thus, Yu would be known forevermore as Yu the Great. With the problem of the Yellow River's violent and destructive floods now under control, agricultural production within Xia was said to have boomed, and so, as we've discussed in previous videos, had an excess of crops, and enough to feed and build an army. And with an army as, as its backbone, Xia's power simply increased even more. But, as with the last of the five emperors, Shun, Yu had to name a successor, and instead of, like his predecessor, naming the most capable candidate after himself, Yu instead passed the throne to his son, Qi. This would begin a key feature of Chinese monarchy for centuries to come, all the way up until the end of the Qing dynasty in the early 20th century. It is said that originally, Yu intended to name his minister as successor to the imperial throne, because he did not wish for his son Qi to bear the great burden of ruling Jia. However, Qi had proven himself so popular with the common people that Yu, in the end on his deathbed, had no choice but to name his son as successor to the throne. Because just as you're raising your foot to kick the bucket, the last thing you want is an angry mob with pitchforks and torches trying to kick your door in because you named somebody a successor that they didn't want. As for the reign of Qi, little is known. However, it is known that Qi's successor, his son, Tai Kang, was criticised as quite a poor ruler. Any chance we could get any reasons behind this? No? Okay, another plot hole. Alright then. So, as for the rulers who came after Tai Kang, we don't actually have any clear names, except for the fourth ruler after Tai Kang's death. This new ruler, Shao Kang, is said in Jia legend to be a hero who after the chaos of the previous four to five rulers managed to revitalise, restabilise, and get the country back on track. It's his rule, among some of his later descendants, that is attributed to the development of armour and the way of chivalry in battle. However, it seems the supply of capable leaders after Shao Kang in Xia was far exceeded by the demand for them. For instance, Emperor Kong Jia, who ruled the Xia dynasty between the years 1789 and 1758 BC. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Were those years? Were those dates? Oh my god, we might have something concrete at last. Oh my god, I can feel the dopamine going nuts upstairs. Woof. Oh, at last we have something that looks like concrete rather than just wood. Ah, oh, good god, this has been a right pain in the neck. Anyway, before I get a bit too excited, it is said in the records we have of the Xia dynasty that the emperors of Xia around this time were given over more towards alcoholism and their own gluttony rather than the gigantic responsibility of ruling 
and keeping a dynasty and a civilization together. And with the declining quality of its leaders, we come towards the end of the Jia dynasty and its subsequent collapse. The last emperor of the Jia dynasty, Ji, ruled from 1728 BC to 1675 BC. This last emperor of the Jia dynasty was known as a great tyrant who was said to have lost the Mandate of Heaven, the mandate which gave the Chinese emperors the right to rule. Having lost the Mandate of Heaven, Ji was overthrown by Tang in the year 1675, who would later go on to found China's more familiar and well-recognized dynasty of ancient times, the Shang Dynasty. So, there you have it. That is the tale of China's supposed first dynasty, the Xia dynasty. Now, our only problem is that much of it, pretty much the entire story of Xia, is shrouded in myth, legend, and the spectacular. So that begs the question, is there anything concrete other than a couple of supposed dates and names to back up this dynasty's existence? Well, you may be surprised. In the 1960s and 1970s AD, the notion that the Xia dynasty was simply nothing more than a myth was fundamentally challenged. With the archaeological discovery of tools, weapons, pottery, and even the ruins of palaces and stone houses in the area where the Xia dynasty was said to exist, in the western regions of Henan province, in the central Yellow River Basin, Aside from this, carbon dating of the artefacts found puts their origin between the years 2000 and 1500 BC. However, despite these archaeological discoveries, the only thing close to a written record by the Jia people that we have been left is just some markings and etchings on pottery found at the site. But even though it's not much, it's still a start. Therefore, perhaps, maybe one day, the mystery of the Jia dynasty's existence may yet be solved. Just like that of the Indus River Valley civilization, there is still much to be discovered about the Jia dynasty, mythical or not. But with that now, ladies and gents, it's time I wrap this up. Just to give you a quick bit of info, I now have a Twitter page. So go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Grand Portfolio. I do a weekly bit of trivia every Monday, known as Mystery Monday. So give us a follow on there for weekly trivia and regular updates on the YouTube channel in particular. And whilst you're here guys, if you like the video maybe consider leaving a like and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any historical or cultural content. But for now, as my paracetamol wears off, it's time for me to go and bandage my head because this was a pain. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching guys. I'm Lewis of The Grand Portfolio, signing off. Oh god, I tell you what, I need to lie down after this one.